Welcome everybody this afternoon to another edition of Breaking Bread. We've got a full quorum, it looks like, here today. Uh, hopefully no hecklers in the crowd. I'm going to ask you guys to do something different today, unless you're really fast with your mute button. Mm -hmm. Don't mute yourself. Just kind of watch your background noise. Okay. Um, but we're going to do something a little different today. There's four um, points or four lessons to today's teaching. And I want you guys to comment, maybe from personal experience, if you're okay sharing a negative personal experience. But I want you guys to to feel free to discuss and comment on each of these points as we make them. We will be going over the book of Hosea chapter 10. We will be reading out of the New King James Version today. And uh, I had a couple of email and text requests on the uh, prayer list. One, of course, you guys all received Dan's cousin-in-law, Terry, today undergoing um, some uh, surgery to remove tumors in his liver and colon, uh, and also salvation for Terry as well. Uh, we just pray for uh, God's hand to guide the doctors as well as for Terry's eyes to be opened. And the second request is a, a little bit unique. Um, uh, Paul is not going to be here at least for this week, and I don't know about next week, but Paul is in Denmark. It's his first transatlantic voyage. He went there on a conference, an eye doctor conference, uh, but he asked for prayer, not for travel mercies, but he asked for prayer because he is going to be at a host home. He's going to be around 10 or 15 uh, other doctors from around other parts of the world. And he just asked that we would pray that he would be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, a, a light to these other people who are coming from other cultures. So there's two things to put on your prayer list for this week, for Terry and for Paul. Uh, to open us up today, Jim, if you would feel comfortable uh, would you start us off with prayer this morning before we get into the teaching? I'll be happy to. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again in this configuration of Lynn's disciples, and we are asking you to be with us as we study your word, to make your word come to life for us, to let us receive it, and walk it out as we do our daily living. Thank you for bringing everyone back safely. Thank you for answering the prayers that we send up to you. And we thank you for how you're going to use us as a result of what we're learning today. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. And we say amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. And not to get all mushy, but as I had a lot of time on my hands, since you saw what my activity level was every day, um, I just wanted to thank you and commend you guys and compliment you. Every week, you guys are engaged in the study of God's work. And sometimes we get a little short-sighted and we don't understand how unusual that is, especially in these days that we live in. People who say they're Christians or that they believe in God uh, usually have an extremely rudimentary knowledge of what that actually even means, much less the, the points of doctrine and things of theology and the kind of stuff that we cover here in Breaking Bread, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a clue. So I hope I've always made this approachable, accessible, understandable, putting it in everyday language. I hope I've always made this to where it was applicable to your lives, uh, practical. Uh, but I just wanted to commend you guys because you've got to understand you're unique. You're unique in a good way. It's not a point of pride, but it, it's just what we all should be doing. And very few people do. And that is to dig into God's word, to learn more about our Lord and Savior, to learn more about how we are to comport ourselves through life, how we are to behave, how we're to and not to earn anything, God forbid not to earn anything, but just to 
to thank the Lord for what he's already done for us, to mm -hmm. want to, to snuggle up next to him and be close to him and not break our fellowship with him when we sin. So I just wanted to commend everybody before we get started today, because as I, as I travel and I chat with people and I um, tell them what I do and, and they, they express interest, um, you know, I hope some of those people find this channel. I hope some of those people start to dig into God's word and understand that every week it's rich. Every week there's lessons to be learned. Every week it speaks to us. And uh, I just wanted to thank you guys for your faithfulness to this teaching. All right, go ahead and turn to Hosea chapter 10. I'm going to be reading verse one and two first. We're going to have a first pause point in these two verses. Now, by the way, we're getting near the end of this book. There's 14 chapters, I believe, in Hosea. So we have four more after today. Then we're going to move back to the New Testament. I already have a, a book that I, I'm, I'm already pretty you know, firmly uh, sure that I'm going to teach on. So it, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about all of these. But today, let's just spend on Hosea and his warnings and the consequences. Now, the, verses one and two, it uses the word he, and he in the first section is talking about Israel, and he in the second section, I think it'll be obvious, is talking about God himself. But let's start. Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. New thought from God's perspective. He will break down their altars and he will ruin their sacred pillars. So what is this talking about? First of all, it says Israel is bringing fruit forth, but just for themselves. God has systematically throughout Israel's history blessed them with material abundance, with protection. They're, they've prospered and they've grown as a people. But what have they done with what God gave them? Now you're going to you're gonna pretty much see where we're going with our first discussions point. They spend it all on themselves. It looks like uh, they are uh, receiving the bountiful uh, blessings of God, but they are building altars to other gods at the same time. Right. So it looks like uh, it's about he's about ready to uh, uh, pay them, uh, you know, pay them back or rebuke them for this because uh, they're they're deceitful. They're being deceitful or trying to be deceitful to God and they have to pay the price. So they've taken the blessings of God. They've spent it on themselves. They spent it on um, idolatrous practices. Um, they enjoyed the blessings, but they've used those blessings in ungodly ways. Now, if we go to the New Testament, Paul, the Apostle Paul, warns about the very same kind of thing. In Galatians, the book that we just studied, the last book that we just studied, in Galatians 5.13, Paul writes, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, and which is exactly what Israel was doing, the nation of Israel. So that brings us to our first lesson, our first discussion. Frequently, as Christians, we take the, the liberties and the blessings of God, and we use them in inappropriate and even ungodly ways ways. So I just want you to think about that. If anybody has any examples or stories from themselves, do we see this today in our own culture? And then I also want to bring something to mind. And that is one of the things that we've always stressed in here, which is I've, I've admitted to you is one of my weak points, why it's important to have the discipline of walking in thankfulness. All right. So go ahead and, and somebody take that two thoughts and, and run with it. When you're thankful and grateful, you're not focusing on yourself, you're focusing on what God's blessing has provided and the one who gives the blessings. Yes, the giver of the blessings. Thank you, Dana, for saying that. 
All right, nobody just like the whole crowd in at once here. <laughs> this is an experiment to see if this works. And so far I would give it a D minus. Any other thoughts, personal experiences, things that you've had in the past where you've shared? Steve, go ahead. Steve, you're on mute, by the way. You got to take stuff off mute. Oh, <laughs> okay. Steve is permanently muted. Good point, Steve. Anybody else? All right. Well, I'm going to move on then. It's important because I see this in our country and I see this in our culture that Bill made this point uh, several weeks ago when he talked about this nation has been blessed. And what have we done with that blessing as a nation? Well, if we look at our culture wars that are going on today, which Steve sent, updates us on and sends out material on, look at the culture wars. Like, for instance, this is Pride Month. So where do you see all the retailers and all the people addressing that? And, and the culture wars are showing us that what God has given us, the blessings that everybody's enjoying in this country, we're not giving thanks for who these blessings are truly from. And the way we give thanks is not only like Dana said, by recognizing where these blessings come from, but also by showing our thankfulness through obedience by what God wants us to do. And, and we're, I think we're failing miserably in this area as a culture. And all I can tell you is individually, you guys, Ron, Linda, Lee, you guys all need to be walking in this spirit and attitude daily of thankfulness to understand that the very next breath that we take is a gift from God. The air conditioning that you guys are no doubt sitting in is a gift from God. Uh, drinking potable water is a gift from God. And then let, we just go on and on and on. There's an endless supply of things to be thankful for that, unfortunately, we take for granted. So the next passage here, and, and this is where, where what unthankfulness gets you. It says their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. Israel had this gotten to this place where their heart is divided and insincere. And how did they, what was the culmination of that? They set up altars, sacred pillars to idols. And Israel had received this blessing from God, but instead of being more responsible, instead of using the blessing wisely, instead of knowing where the blessing came from, instead they used it foolishly and they used God's blessings in wicked ways. So what does God say he's going to do at the very end of verse two? He said, I'm going to break down those altars to pagan gods. I'm going to ruin their sacred pillars that you've made into idols. All right, let's move on to verse three through eight. Now, this is a big chunk. Uh, verse three through eight. Uh, there's no particular lesson in this section but I need to do some explaining because it's making some references uh, that you may not be familiar with. So I will uh, read it through and then we'll break it down into bite-sized pieces. Um, Hosea continues now, he says, for now they say, speaking about Israel, speaking in the first person, we have no king because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? Do you get the attitude that's coming across with that? And so Hosea, from God's perspective, says this. They have spoken these words, swearing falsely in making a covenant. Thus, judgment springs up like a hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria fear, not because of God. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf, the golden calf of Beth Avon. For its people mourn for it. And its priests shriek for it because its glory has departed from it. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present. 
for King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us and to the hills, fall on us. So let me explain what's happening here with this section. You've just seen this progression of Israel's entire history in verses three through eight. How do you get that, Lynn? You, we're going to take you from where Israel started and how far they've fallen in these five or six verses. Originally, this gaggle of people assembled at the base of Mount Sinai, Moses comes down with the law of God and they and they they pledge themselves. Here you see Hosea said they made a covenant, but they made a false covenant. They swore falsely to this covenant. But at the foot of Mount Sinai, they pledged themselves to God's rule. And now look at them today. There was a long, continuous downward spiral from the days of Mount Sinai to where Hosea is today for the nation of Israel. And you can see that in their forms of government. All right. So first of all, they had a, a, um, a theocracy. They were ruled by God and God alone. And then the next step level down was they were, they followed Moses, who was the prophet lawgiver. And then they followed um, Joshua, who is more of their military general, their military leader. And then we went through the era, uh, and there's a book called this, called The Judges, where uh, you had a judicial form of government where God would raise up a, a judge of the land. And then you enter King Saul in a period where Israel said, hey, all the other nations have kings. We want a king. And so God got tired of hearing them just constantly asking for something that wasn't going to turn out well for them. So he gave them a king. So we had a, a monarchy form of government. And now we progressed all the way to this section in Hosea. I just wanted to run that history past you because here they say, we have no king. As for a king, what would he do for us? Now, Israel in its final stages, on the verge of its last breath, and it doesn't even realize it, has no government. Israel is ruled by anarchy at this point, and it tracks with their spiritual decay. Their governmental decay tracks right along with their spiritual decay. Next point. He talks about Samaria and Beth Avon, and I got I to gotta make all this fit for you guys. It says Samaria fears Beth Avon. What is that? What is that talking about? Beth Avon was that slur that Hosea used in the previous couple of chapters when he described the town of Bethel. Bethel was a town of prophets, a holy town, but Israel had turned it into a town of idolatry. So instead of Bethel being house of God, Beth Avon is Hosea's way of saying it's a house of vanity. They've ruined this town. And Samaria and Bethel, the history behind this is when Jeroboam, the first king of this split kingdom of the northern kingdom, who was not a good king, he didn't want his people traveling down to worship God at the temple in Jerusalem. So he went, ah, the people want to worship. Here's what I'll do. I'll set up two golden calves and say, hey, guys, there's no need to travel all the way down to, to Jerusalem. You can stay right here. I'll set one up in Samaria and I'll set one up in Bethel. You don't even have to go far. Here's your gods. Come worship them there. And so there was these two calves set up in these two cities. Well, the cities became jealous of one another. Samaria was jealous of the calf at Beth Avon or Bethel, and the Bethel people were jealous that 
Samaria had their own calf. And so that was their only concern. They weren't concerned that they were worshiping a false idol. They were only concerned with another city's competing calf and the business that that brought into them during the times of worship. So this is just mind boggling. You're down to under 20 years before everything is going to be destroyed. So virtually on a historical basis, on the eve of their own destruction, Israel doesn't fear God. They're not mourning for the sin. They're, they're fear and mourn only for their stupid golden caps. And by the way, Hosea pro prophetically says, and history bears this out, oh, that golden calf, it's going to be captured and carried away and given to the king of Assyria as a gift, as booty. And then it concludes the king's going to be swept away like a stick floating down a rapid river. The false temples will be destroyed and the sacred pillars are going to come down. And, you know, I told you they were set these up in these beautiful grove areas typically. But you know what your groves are going to look like, Israel? There won't be anybody left in the land. Assyria is either going to kill everybody and the people it doesn't kill, it's going to take away as horrible slave labor and your precious temples and your precious false pillars in these grove-like settings. You know what's going to be in them? I'm going to translate this in, in Florida terms. It's going to be filled full of sand spurs. It's thorns and thistles will be where all those beautiful groves used to be. So when Israel finally realizes and Assyria is at the gate and they're crying out to God and God refuses to hear them and the calamities upon them, they already know they already know how Assyria treats uh, the people that it's invading. Uh, as I've in, mentioned before, Assyria was a, a brutal conqueror. They were not polite about it at all. They were horrible. You're going to read something in a minute about what they did to the women and the children. But literally, they cried out when they realized all hope was lost. They cried out, cover us, fall on us. They wanted the mountains to end us quickly because the way the Assyrians are going to kill us is going to be horrible. And they wanted the mountains to fall on them. Now, actually, what's interesting, Jesus himself uses the same type of language when he describes another time of great distress. During the time of tribulation, when people have done nothing but rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior, when nothing but global calamity is falling upon them, Wars, pestilence, natural cataclysms, people will cry out, Jesus says, during the tribulation. And he says this in Luke 23, 20. To, the, the, they'll pray, they'll wish, they'll plead for, the, for the, the mountains to fall on us, the hills to fall on them. Because of the awfulness that's going to be happening to them. All right, go to, with me now to verse 9 through 11. And we're going to um, cover this. Again, there's no lesson part on this, so just bear with me. Oh, Israel, God says, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. But when it is my desire, I will chasten them. People shall be gathered against them when I bind them for their two transgressions. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but instead I harnessed her fair neck and I will make her pull a plow. And Judah will also pull a plow <laughs> and Jacob will have to bust up dirt clods. So what is this talking about? First of all, he references Gibeah, which we, we've had this reference before in chapter nine. So what is this about? If you want to read about this horrible sin that happened, um, basically the nation of Israel had to go up and attack their own brothers, the Benjamites. But how this came about, you can go read it in Judges 19. It was this horrific 
time during Israel's history. And, and, and Hosea makes the point through God. He says, even though there was a battle in Gibeah against these children of iniquity, Israel didn't learn the lesson. It, it, it compares the sin that they're doing now to the sins that were occurring back to, in the days of Gibeah. And, and so he says, you didn't learn anything from this horrible period of your history. God wanted this willfully blind Israel to see their past sins and not repeat them, but instead repent from them, but they wouldn't. So he says, when it is my time, when it is my desire, I will chasten them. I will punish them. They're like unruly farm animals that refuse to do what they're told. So God will harness them. He will control them. He will guide Israel and Judah, though they will be kicking the whole way against the process. He says, um, these I will bind them because of their two transgressions. The two transgressions that Hosea is speaking about is the calf in Bethel and the calf in Samaria. They symbolize their idolatry and their falling away from God. So he says, you're going to be punished for those two transgressions. And then he used this, this illustration of a cow, a heifer. He, he, he said Ephraim used to be like uh, this nice cow that all it had to do was tread grain and and it could stop anytime it wanted and it could eat the grain it was treading and it could chew and eat as much and be as happy as a as a pig in mud but he said now i'm going to harness her fair neck i'm going to strap a, a a bridle around it and now instead of leisurely treading grain and eat you're going to pull a plow. You're going to break up dirt clods. And this speaks of their, if you survive the assault of Assyria, you're going to be in hard labor as a slave in Assyria. And we saw that reference in the previous two chapters because it refers to them like you were in Egypt. You're going to be slave labor, but this time in Assyria. All right, verses, uh, let's just go to 12. Let me just do 12 by itself because I've got, it's kind of lengthy, and I want to, I want to pause on this and spend some time on this, because I really was moved by verse 12. I saw a lot of application to myself in verse 12. He says, God says, listen, he's still pleading with them. Listen to God's heart. He's talking to Israel. God says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So even at this 11th hour and 59th minute, God is still trying to reach the people of Israel. He is still trying to plead with them. It's not too late. Please turn. Sow in righteousness, reap in mercy. And, and, and so even though they're this close, to being wiped out, God is still pleading with them to change. But instead, they've sown the seed of sin. And what they will reap, the harvest they will reap, is going to be judgment and destruction. Brings me to my second lesson. We all sow something into our life every single day. Are we sowing seeds of righteousness? Or are we sowing seeds of sin? And based on what you're sowing, what kind of crop is going to grow from the seeds that you've planted today, in the past week, maybe in the month of May? So I want you guys to talk about that. I want you to think about that for 30 seconds. I want you to just pause and think about the seeds that you sown in the past day, week, and month. There, there have been things that that uh, I have done. I've planned trips, uh, bought 
airplane tickets, made reservations, and and then my situation collapses around me. And now I've got all of these planned things out there that um, that I still have yet to deal with, but now I've got life situation right at hand. And you go and say, God, how can, what can I do with this? You know, how can you make a way out of no way? And then all of a sudden, everything else starts to dissipate, <laughs> you know? And you know, you had no control over it. I didn't have any control over the dissipation of all of these things that were, 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 were surrounding me. And he allowed me to back out of each one of those plans without any penalties for backing out of them and and dealing with what I had at hand. And it was nothing but God. I mean, I, there was no, I had no way of dealing with them. And I said, Lord, how, you're the God that can make a way out of no way. Yeah. And I just let it go, threw up my hands. And all of a sudden, everything just started dissipating and problems started dis allevi being alleviated. And, and life was smooth sailing again because <laughs> I confessed that I was doing things that I wanted to do and not considering, not count, not even asking him if it was okay. Yeah. I just took it upon myself. This is what I'm going to do. All right. Now we and got God about. Good. He let me undo it. Yeah. Now we've got about three minutes. So I've got another enough time for maybe one other person. What kind of. See, uh, Bill, I just saw your finger go up. Go ahead. Well, uh, similar to the gym. Um, uh, last year when I went to Europe and I went to Israel, uh, I had to apply for my passport expedition to expedite it, paid extra. And here we are now uh, less than uh, a week before my departure date and nothing was being done. It had been almost two months. And so eventually you say, well, you got to call on such a day. And they tell me, okay, go Friday, pick it up in Miami. It'll be printed for you, which is the same day as my departure day. Mm. And so I said, well, God, I mean, uh, up to you, you know, I, I don't see how I can do that. <laughs> and then out of nowhere, I call the, the State Department. I mean, I call Washington, D.C. And two days later, I had my passport. And it was a God moment. I mean, uh. Never in my mind would have crossed all the State Department. But uh, you prayed and you put that thought in your mind. I called it and they got it. Hmm. <laughs> Again, it's one of those things. Yeah. Well, it's a lesson for all of us. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's where he went. All right, guys, we're going to finish this section. Um, I've just got, we got less than two minutes. So I'm going to ask you to hop off and then hop back on as quickly as you can. If anybody else has any thoughts about uh, sowing and reaping, we'll cover them when we get back on here in just a few minutes. So I'll see you back here as soon as possible.